evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Allison Jessing, and I'm the head of adult curriculum for Howard County Library System. I wanted to take a moment just to introduce myself and acknowledge our, um, our panelists tonight and just a few housekeeping notes. We're going to have a really engaging and fascinating conversation tonight. We're really in for a treat, but just a few things to know. We're in webinar mode, which means your camera and microphone are turned off. So just check the chat for information on how to turn the captions on and off, how to pin an interpreter if you wish to do so. And there's also a link to Zoom support if you need any assistance. 10 lucky participants tonight will be randomly selected to receive a free copy of Let's Go In, My Journey to University Presidency by T. Allen Hurwitz. And we will be notifying those lucky folks by email later this week. I just ask you to please bear with us as we're experiencing some shipping delays due to supply chain issues, as I'm sure you've heard about in the news recently. I would like to sincerely thank our presenters, Alan Hurwitz and Angie Officer, our interpreters, Jennifer and Sarah, and captionist, Anna, my colleague, Diane Lee, who assisted in the planning of this event, and especially our community partners, Howard County Association of the Deaf, a Maryland Deaf Culture Digital Library. Now I am going to turn it over to Elkie Peters, president of Howard County Association of the Deaf, who will introduce our guest speakers tonight. Okay. Hope I'm visible to all. Good evening, good evening. I do have notes in front of me, so you might see me glance off to the side, and that is why. Let me introduce myself. I'm Elkie Peters. I am currently the president of the Howard County Association of the Deaf, HCAD. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. One of HCAD's missions, we have many, but one of them is to spread awareness about deaf authors. We want the community to know that we are writing and I am proud to announce that we have an excellent working relationship with the Howard County Library System, as well as the Maryland Digital Deaf Culture. And that's been for a few years, but we have partnered uh, and put together different book events. Tonight is our first virtual book event for 2022. So on behalf of these two libraries and HCAD, I am honored to introduce Angie Officer, who graduated from RIT and is currently the Senior Project Manager for T-Mobile Accessibility. She is going to have a conversation with Dr. Alan Hurwitz. And they're gonna be talking about his book entitled, Let's Go In, My Journey to a University Presidency. Now, Alan had a very successful career in various leadership positions in a variety of professional as well as deaf advocacy organizations, including serving as a president of the National Technical Institute of the Deaf, NTID, and as president of Gallaudet University. I'm sure you'll enjoy. It's time to sit back, watch, and learn from this conversation. Thank you all, and let's welcome Angie and Dr. Hurwitz. Please turn on your cameras. Hello, and thank you so much for that nice, entry, nice introduction, Elkie. I'm honored to introduce Alan T. Hurwitz and his beautiful wife, Vicki. You will have an opportunity to listen to my conversation with Dr. Hurwitz tonight. And we're gonna talk about his life journey, his book, and I'm showing you right now, as you can see the cover of the book, 
is called T. Allen Hurwitz. Let's go in. My journey to the university presidency. After reading his book, I learned so much about Dr. Hurwitz, about his beautiful family, his personal journey. And actually Dr. Hurwitz told me, he said, please call me Alan instead of Dr. Hurwitz during this call. And you know, what a humble guy he is. Throughout his book, Alan shared his experience from his heart and his soul. He talked about his childhood, his challenges, his successes, his disappointments, and his experiences that shaped his personal and professional life. Alan had a successful career and all a variety of different leadership positions and as a deaf advocacy organization. <clears throat> as president of NTID, he then became president of Gallaudet University and the superintendent of the national, I'm sorry, the president of the National Association of the Deaf in the 80s. Alan's relationship with his wife, Vicki, as you can see her by his side, is characterized by um, admiration, a mutual respect and compassion. Can you believe that Al, they've dated each other since their sophomore year of high school? They have been together that long, long time. And obviously she is the love of his life. And Vicki, do you actually, could you share the pink bear that you have uh, that Alan used to propose to you? So that teddy bear is now 58 years old. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Now he is the love of her life and the love of his life. And really just reading their love story gave me such goosebumps. Just seeing them while I was a student at RIT, I could see them together and it was wonderful. Alan was born deaf to a very highly motivated deaf parents. And they were great role models as well to Alan. Alan was the only child. His mom would always look for articles about successful deaf adults and would always share that with Alan. And she always emphasized to Alan saying, you can do whatever and anything you want to do. And his father really taught him to have a very strong work ethic. Uh, he learned from both of his parents about the value of hard work. So it's no wonder why Alan has such a strong work ethic. He has a strong leadership skill and he's always striving for the best. It's amazing. You know, I wish I could have met his parents. His parents sound so amazing. And I really just love this story. So when Alan and Vicki arrived at Gallaudet University at the front gate, Alan just stared at the sign and just looked at the campus. And with a gulp, he said, Vicki, should we go forward or should we just turn around and drive back home to Rochester, New York? And that way we can stay with our family and our friends that we know. And Vicki smiled at him and hold Alan's hand real hard and said, let's go in. Thanks to Vicki, really, you made this happen. And really, Alan was an amazing president for Gallaudet University. Okay, so now I'm going to ask questions to Alan. I'm going to ask about three to five questions. And for those of you in the audience who want to send your personal questions, please make sure you type that in in the Q&A. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're gonna see a Q&A button. Click on there and ask your question. Thank you so much. Now, Alan, are you ready for your first question? I am. It's really right. an honor to be here. It's an honor to be part of this program. Wonderful. Especially with you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure. So Alan, why did you decide to write this book and to share your journey? Well, you know, 
some of it has, you've described some of my journey already, but there were a lot of lessons that I learned over the years. Gaining the ability to see things from different perspectives, trying to understand how you progress in your career. But, you know, my wife, Vicki, was so encouraging of me to write this book. Um, I didn't think I would ever bother to write a book, but I was convinced that I had a story to tell. And I started to think about it. And I realized, in fact, I have many stories that I could share with the larger community. So the deaf community, of course, but also parents and families of deaf children, those involved in academia, presidents, faculty, students as well. I thought actually a lot of people might find some value in the stories that I have to share about my own journey. So I thought I'd go ahead and do it and share some of those perspectives in this book. And that's sort of how it came about. And I went ahead and wrote it. Not to say that it was easy, but I am actually very happy I did. Wow. You know, I really enjoyed your book. I have to admit that I really learned so much more. And I thought I knew you as a couple very well, but there's a lot more that I did not realize. Um, you know, for example, I didn't know that you had deaf parents and that was really inspiring. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you so much for the answering the first question. So the second question is that your father graduated from the Iowa School for the Deaf, which is about an hour and a half away from your home. And your mother graduated from CID, which is 500 miles away from your home. Why did your parents decide to then send you to CID, which is further than the Iowa School for the Deaf? Any thoughts? Well, it's like you said, my mom had gone to CID herself and she felt very strongly that she uh, was quite well educated in that setting. And she talked it over with my father. And my father also recognized that my mother had some skills. She was really able to um, communicate with hearing community, including his own parents with whom he had limited communication. And so he realized that she had gained skills kind of to, to step into both worlds. And because of that, he agreed that CID might be the best placement for me to get a better education. Now, of course, that isn't to say that the Iowa School for the Deaf uh, wasn't offering a good education to their students, they were. But um, my parents made that decision at that time and sent me far away, as you said. And as you hinted at, that was not an easy thing to do to send your child 500 uh, miles away, especially given that I was only four when I was sent off. And I write about that in the book. Right. Uh, my mom struggled, you know, to let go of her only child at the age of four, but it was the decision that she also felt strongly about. Right. I, I, I really think that just has made you to be an independent person because you had to go through that experience that you were away from your parents and it really taught you a lot of things um, like it did for me. I actually went to CID as well. Um, I did not graduate from CID, but that experience really taught me a lot of independence, taught me a lot about leadership as well, which is beautiful. You know, not only independence, I'll, I'll go further. Um, I didn't have siblings, remember. So going to CID almost felt like I was, you know, going to a large family, you know, because the, all of the boys in the dorm were like my brothers. And so it was a very enjoyable experience in the end. I believe that. Yeah. And you might feel like you have a big family, you know, you feel like you have 10 brothers. Are you still in touch with all of your classmates from CID? Some of them I do still have contact with. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, my next question is, why did you change your career from uh, engineering and computer programming to special education? Um, special education was what I did sort of later in higher ed. But when I was a young boy, I always dreamed of becoming a teacher, a teacher for deaf students. Um, unfortunately, that dream was not encouraged by my parents. And so I ended up going, you know, a different route in my education, but I never lost that desire to be in education. And so I went to the Iowa School for the Deaf and met with one of the teachers there. Um, 
and had been there for many years and asked this teacher, my mother actually asked this teacher to share with me whether or not it was a good idea for me to pursue this dream. And at that time, that teacher actually discouraged me from pursuing the dream of being a teacher. Didn't sound like it would be a good future for deaf students. Um, there was no room for promotion. Back then at that time, remember I was younger, so it was sort of a different paradigm, but that made an impact on me. And I just happened to be pretty talented with math and science and enjoyed those fields. I enjoyed those courses. So I ended up pursuing that throughout high school and college and became an engineer. And then a few years later, NTID was established, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And I thought to myself, what a beautiful opportunity here to pursue my dream of being an educator melded with my science background, my skills that I have in this particular field of engineering. It really was a perfect fit at the time. And so I made that move from the world of work into the world of education via NTIB. It sounds like you had the best of both worlds. You had the engineering experience, but then also you had special education, higher ed, and that really made you very successful uh, for being a president at NTID and later at Gallaudet University as well. So thanks to the skills that you honed and your passion that you had, that made you to become um, a, a really great president that really impacts students and their future. And also Vicki provided support too with counseling and so forth. Um, she was very, you know, Know, an important value add as well. Thank you. Yes, true. Absolutely. Now, before you were um, the president of NAD, what was the most important lesson that you learned as the president of the National Association of the Deaf? What was you know, as a leader, what did you learn and what did you want to advise future presidents of NAD and, and how they can make a difference? Yeah, I'll say that my experience as president of NAD was a wonderful experience. I uh, got involved originally at the local level, like at the affiliate level. So the Rochester Association of the Deaf. Uh, was where I made my entree into this world. And then um, New York State Association for the Deaf uh, was the next level up, kind of the state level. And then I got involved at the national level, the national organization. It was a wonderful experience because I was able to meet with a lot of different role models, deaf people who were successful in their various careers and fields. And I was able to bring forth their perspectives to share their experiences with the larger community, with you know, our youth. They are so hungry to learn. And so we were able to put in place mentorship experiences. And I think it really gave me the networking opportunity. I mean, I traveled all over the country. I met all sorts of people, went you know, to every state. Um, in fact, even went all over the world. It just, it was a wonderful uh, leadership opportunity for me. I was able to meet other leaders and see kind of what were the important features and functions that people had that made them successful. And so it was a wonderful experience for me. I believe it. I remember when I enrolled to RIT in the 80s and you were the president of NAD, I was very impressed that NTID, excuse me, and I was very impressed that you came over and you were explaining about the NAD and you actually told me, do you know anything about NAD? And I was still trying to study and just go through my college courses, but you were wonderful in a way of teaching us about NAD early on as a young, as a young individual. So I really appreciate you educating us instead of, you know, after college, I finally realized what NAD, NAD is and what they do for us. Yeah. Let me, let me add to that. Um, I worked with different people, like I said, from all over the, the country, um, who are dealing with lots of different issues and advocacy concerns. And we were able to, I think, make some inroads in the work that we were doing as an advocacy organization. I wanna say that it was 
you know, such a, a valuable experience for me in that I took those skills and, and applied them to NTID and later Gallaudet University. The skills of working with people who have very different backgrounds, very different perspectives, different walks of life, resolving sometimes painful issues having to do with perceptions and perspectives. Um, but we all get kind of to the same page. We all have a similar goal, which is advancing our community. So I think that position helped me so much. Right. I, I'm sure you really experienced a different type of um, diversity within different people's um, expectations or perceptions. Um, people have different um, perceptions of things, and that really has helped you um, to become very successful. So thanks to NAD for just learning all of the different perspectives. And also thank you um, with your leadership as well um, and helping, you know, to have successful deaf adults as well. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. You know, Alan, I I really admire you, Alan. And you know, my God, when I was reading this book, you applied for so many different positions and you did not get the job. I mean, but you continued to be optimistic. You strived and endured. And there are so many different jobs that you applied for. For example, the superintendent position for Iowa School for the Deaf the CEO position at the Lexington School of the Deaf, provost at Gallaudet University. Uh, you also applied for the superintendent position in North Carolina, the School for the Deaf, but you actually withdrew that application later. But you did not receive any of those job offers. What did you learn through that process and that experience of applying for all of those jobs? Well, one lesson I learned is that it's not a good idea to look out in the world when you might already be depressed. That's not the right time to be looking you know, for a new job or accepting an invitation for an interview at another position. The best time is when you're actually pretty content with what you're doing in your life. You know, things are going along just fine. And then if you're invited to apply, you know, the stakes aren't quite so high. If you're invited to interview, it's a decision you can make kind of with a cool head. Um, you might wanna know what's happening out there in the world. Maybe you'll find something that fits you even better, um, fits your interests, your skills uh, and your goals. These were all wonderful experiences for me to go to these different places, to have these different interviews, meet with search committee members, whether they be faculty or teachers, uh, alumni, and kind of just learning what's happening in their context. Mm -hmm. And it helped me, every interview helped me to improve my next interview, of course. And so over time, those were the lessons that I learned and I could take the lessons I learned in one position, one questions that had been posed to me. Um, and sometimes I found myself trying to kind of embellish my answers. And, and actually I had uh, someone from a search committee come up to me after an interview to have a private conversation with me to let me know they thought I had done quite well in their interview, but that I should work on cutting my answers down. They felt like I had kind of answered all of the questions that they had ready to ask in the first question that they asked. And so um, I was encouraged at that point to tailor my questions and my answers to the questions that were, that were asked. Um, and that was a lesson for me. I think over time, I got a little bit better at that. And when I interviewed at other positions, I was able to answer the question that was asked and not go off script. But yeah, it was, they were all wonderful learning experiences and even not being um, offered a position, I think I just didn't let that bother me because I had learned something and that was valuable and I was going to carry that on to whatever I was going to do next. I knew at some point, you know, I would find the right position. What was meant to be would be. And I kind of kept my eyes on the prize. Right. Yeah. So from your experience, I'm sure you had a lot of good feedback that you received from those leaders who you who interviewed you. And I think that probably helped guide you 
Um, and it, you know, maybe taught you to keep your answers short and sweet, right? Instead of just going on and on. Uh, believe it or not, um, I have the same experience. And I was laughing at that when I was reading that part in the book, because when I started working for Sprint Relay, uh, my, my, what I thought was, you know, I always had to explain everything from beginning to end, you know, A to Z, so to speak. My emails were long. I mean, I had so so much information in those emails. And then people would say, Angie, can you please keep your email short and sweet? But I thought that was the right thing to do was to over explain or overshare. And so I understand where you're coming, where you're coming from. Sometimes you think it's important to share as much as you can because you have a lot of knowledge and you know a lot. But at the same time, you know, that is good advice too. So thanks for sharing that advice. Uh, also, you wrote in your book that President Abraham Lincoln as well applied for or just went after 14 different positions trying to be elected. And uh, he never gave up. He kept on going and he was persistent. And so that's something that I learned too through Abraham Lincoln is that, you know, there's a great message there as well. And I'm glad that you followed in his footsteps. Now, for all of those people that are watching, if you're looking for a job and you haven't received that job that you want, don't give up. Keep going. Continue on that path and follow Alan's advice. You know, eventually your dream will come true and just don't give up. You want to just, you know, continue your dream and strive always for the best. Yep. I love that. All right. Just looking at my list for the next question. All right. So what is your biggest challenge or success as a president when you were president at Gallaudet University and or at NTID? Well, there were there are many things that I'm quite proud of. But I want to be clear that it's not just me that made all of these things happen. So I think what's important is to create a climate, an environment that allows people to really shine, to do their jobs well. So I'm proud of many things that were accomplished both at NTID as well at Gallaudet when I was there. So for example, at Gallaudet University, several graduate degree programs were established. And so I'm proud of of that move, but I do want to give appropriate credit to the faculty, the staff who worked so hard to make those things happen. Yeah, there are many things that I'm proud of. That's amazing. You know, Alan, I was actually surprised to find out that through challenging experiences with Al that you had with um, Alexander Graham Bell, and there was a dorm that was named after Alexander Graham Bell. And so you had to go through a lot of listening sessions. You had to go through and listen to people's advice or feedback to make sure you made the right decision. And I was surprised when I was reading in your book that you mentioned that um, the AGB family, the Bell family did not contribute any money or the organization of AGB did not give any um, money as well. And so it made your decision to be very easy to remove that name from the dorm. Um, I think that was a very smart decision. Um, I didn't understand or realize that you went through that experience. So actually, I didn't make the ultimate decision to do that. You know, NTID is one of 10 colleges under RIT's um, right. position, so to speak, right? And so the board of trustees, as the board of trustees who have the power to make the ultimate decision to change a building's name. And I will say that they, there was some hesitation on their part. They were a bit nervous about changing because it was a historical name. And we wanted to make sure they fully understood the rationale why this change was so important. So when they found out that um, the A.G. Bell family had never contributed money um, and neither did the organization. That sort of helped them make that decision ultimately. But, but you're right, it wasn't an easy process to go through. It required us to really listen 
again, to different people, different perspectives, hear where they were coming from. And ultimately we felt that it was the right decision to make. Right. I have to applaud you and commend you. I can't imagine what you went through in that situation. I'm sure it was very, um, how do you say like sticky? Cause you want to make sure that you're neutral. Um, you want to make sure that you're fair. You want to make sure that you hear everybody with their perspectives, including the board of trustees, including the students. Uh, and so just reading the, reading your book, I just felt like, you know, there was probably a lot of stress there. I felt I was stressed for you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. But I just, you know, I, it's just a mat. Wow. I'm imagining that you went through that. And I read that and I was like, Ooh, I would not want to be in Alan's position going through that. And so just, I wanted to congratulate you for being professional, for being neutral and just hearing everybody out. And really the staff and the community was very just happy. And so congratulations with your accomplishment on that success. Also too, um, I, there's something else that I found out that I did not know before, but you set up the doctorate program for interpreting and in translate, interpreting and translation also um, education educational neuroscience education and neuroscience and the professional programs in four different areas at gallaudet university so that is huge so right now i mean the interpreting field is such a huge field these days and so i just want to recognize too like the movie coda um you know they make you know, interpreters and people out there signing more visible, and you were already ahead of the game. I mean, you already set up the interpreting program at Gallaudet University. So for those people who are thinking about becoming an interpreter, potentially, who are watching that movie, there's already a program there established. And also at NTID as well, they also have an interpreting program there too. So again, congratulations, right, a graduate program. I think it's such an amazing accomplishment and it's a big deal. You know, again, I, I need to give credit, you know, to where it's due, which is the faculty and the staff who worked so hard to develop um, that program so that we could offer a PhD in interpreting. Um, I think we, you know, the full support of the administration, the board of trustees, you know, then you can sort of move forward in an academic context in, in getting programs established. So kudos to everyone who made that happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you are a wonderful example of leadership. And the reason why is because you take time to recognize other people instead of just taking it all and just talking about me, 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 you actually are giving credit where credit is due. You really do believe in uh, a true team and, you know, having teamwork that makes the dream work. Right. And so just, you're thankful to those people that are involved making these things happen. Thank you. All right, uh, the next question, maybe it's easy, maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> what are your biggest regrets? Just through your whole journey of life, your biggest regrets? Wow. I mean, I have several, but I, I mentioned in the book that one of my regrets is I was a Boy Scout when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I, progressed in the organization, but I didn't go as far as I could have. The, I didn't become an Eagle Scout, which was something I was really hoping to achieve. Um, but because of transferring from one school to another, I uh, basically ended up leaving the, the Boy Scouts. I didn't have an opportunity to continue in that organization and reach that highest level of Eagle Scout. That's something that I do regret. In terms of my professional life, I'm not sure that I can discuss them, you know, publicly, um, but there are some HR human resources issues that I experienced over the years and some decisions that I had to make were so hard. Um, and after difficult discussions and, and thinking about it, there are some things that, that I wish could have been handled in, in different ways. Um, when Gallaudet was going through uh, budget difficulties, for example, we had to make some very, very difficult decisions um, to reduce the workforce. 
which means, of course, laying people off. That is never easy. And again, I want to applaud the Human Resources Department for the work that they did that was so hard with those individuals so that they could get retrained, they could move on to other departments if they so chose. Um, we wanted to provide support in, in retraining people. So those sorts of things, you know, you always wish that, that they didn't happen, but of course that is part of the job and it kind of comes with the territory as president, at least the president of the university. That's right. I mean, sometimes you just want to hold and keep people forever, right? And But you have to make business decisions sometimes. That's best for the university. It's not easy. And, and no one wants to go through that particular experience of layoffs because you develop friendships, then relationships with people that you've had for years, and then you have to lay them off. I can't imagine how challenging that would be. Um, so thank you for sharing your experience. And also too, could you share your experience of uh, the dissolving the social work program? I know that the social work program uh, really meant a lot to Vicki and Vicki graduated from the social work program. And so I know that it was so hard for many people. And I actually have several girlfriends who were um, majors in the social work department and they were sad to see their bachelor degree program dissolve. So could you share a little bit more about your experience? And also Vicki, feel free to share your experience too. Yes, I wrote about that in, in the book and um, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll make it brief here. I'll try to keep it brief as possible. Sure, thank you. The program at RIT it was not at NTID, it was technically at, at RIT. It was one of the most successful programs. And about half the students were deaf and half the students were hearing. It was really a very successful model. And the graduates went on to do great things. Many of them became leaders in their own right in their careers. But it was a decision that RIT made uh, to, to cut that program. And they approached me and asked if that program could perhaps be rehoused. I thought that was a good idea. So then I thought they would provide us with the resources such as the faculty. I think there were five full-time faculty at that point uh, for that program that they would then be transferred over to NTID. But I was told that that wasn't going to happen, that I would have to basically source resources myself. And the accrediting, accreditation body, the National Certifying Organization had very strict requirements for what a program must have. And so I, they have to have five faculty members who have the doctoral degree in their various disciplines. So there were just, a lot of issues. Uh, so we brought it back to the administration. We talked about we talked about finding those resources. We went to the US Department of Education to ask if they would be willing to supplement um, our funding in order to keep this bachelor's program afloat. Um, they turned us down because Gallaudet University had a social work degree already. So they didn't see the need for another one. They didn't, they thought, you know, it's uh, duplicating efforts and unnecessary and they felt that NTID should kind of remain with its mission, which is sort of in the technology field. Um, Gallaudet is a liberal arts school, NTID more of a technical school, at least back then for sure. So we had to make this difficult decision that we really couldn't accept the social work bachelor's program. And that had a big impact on me because I knew so many successful graduates of the program and I knew so many of them would be upset. There was a lot of anger in the community it was a tough time and I had to deal with that, with the fallout from that decision. But now that's, what is that, 30 years ago at this point? That's right, it was 30 years ago. So I'm, I'm hopeful that nowadays, um, you know, that people are innovating in terms of how programs could be rehoused and it wouldn't happen again, we'll see. No, you're right, Alan. Thank you so much for sharing that, just your experience with um, social work. 
I just remembered that happening 30 years ago. And I was actually a student at that time. And it really impacted a lot of people, um, including your wonderful wife, Vicki, as well. I do remember that time very vividly. And, you know, with society nowadays, there are a lot of um, issues with mental health. And so I'm really hopeful that RIT and NTID would then be willing to just be open to having a social work program again, especially just in this environment that we're in. We'll see. We'll see if something like that will happen. Or it might be a, a slightly different kind of a program that focuses on human services, let's say. Yeah, which, right. is a, which is a broader discipline, you know, not just social work, but kind of a broader field. I believe, in fact, that they're working on, on a concept, according to what I'm remembering from what I've read. I hope that it comes to fruition in the near future. I agree. I keep, yeah, I hope that it does happen. Um, Vicki, I was just so impressed with you. Uh, you were very persistent. You said at no matter what age, you just went ahead and you got your bachelor's degree at 39 years old. And you're a wonderful mother for your two, um, two children. And why did you decide to then just major in social work later in life? Let's see if I can make this concise. I, I wasn't um, really comfortable in school. I went through school without interpreting services. Right. Um, I left CID. I ended up in a, in a public school. I had no interpreting services. I did not really enjoy school, let's say. And then moved to Rochester from St. Louis. Um, and that was, you know, that was a big deal for me. You know, I had so many people and so many deaf people at NTID and so many successful deaf people who had graduated with degrees in various fields, like Alan. I'm trying to remember, do you remember? Um, there's a friend I'm thinking of, yeah, there is a, one of our friends. Joan. Joan. Um, was going for her bachelor's at I think U of R, one of the one of the schools up there, and and Alan asked her to ask me to just you know come along to one of the classes, check it out. Uh, this was a class at RIT. And I wasn't really interested, but she was like, just take this class with me. It won't be such a big deal. And Alan, you know, encouraged me to do it, and so I had some trepidation, but I went ahead and sat in on this class. Um, and at that time, we had a, well, it was almost two at that point. And, and so I had to ask a neighbor to babysit so I could go to this class. Um, and it was really an awakening for me. It was the first time I was in a class with an interpreting, you know, interpreter. And it was a wonderful experience. And I didn't realize how much I had missed being in classrooms that were you know, predominantly hearing without interpreting services. It was really eye-opening. I was able to participate in the conversations and the discussions that were happening with the other students. So anyway, um, it was just a one-time thing, but I really believed, you know, I'm gonna take care of my son. That's, that's my, you know, I'm a homemaker. That's kind of where I'm at in my life. And several years later, once, you know, they were off to school. I kind of had a little time to myself to think about what I might want to do. I did some volunteer work and I was volunteering at a school and kind of one thing led to another, basically. That's awesome. You know, let me just say on, on Vicki's behalf, not only that, but getting that degree at 39 and going on and getting a graduate degree at age 49. So no slouch. <laughs> I had no intention of going for a master's degree. But to keep my job at the student life team, I needed to you know, keep my hand in. And so it was a temporary thing, I thought. It was temporary staff at that point. Um, and then uh, that meant I could keep the job. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, Vicki. I want the audience uh, you know, just to think about that, just, you know, if you want to go to college later in life, I mean, Vicki went through that. I mean, if she can do that, you all can do that as well. So keep that in mind. If that's something that you want to do, if you want to go back to school and it doesn't matter 
it's, it's just never too late. That's right. Never too never late. Never too late. Yeah. Thanks Vicki for sharing your, uh, your journey as well. It's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I just want to, okay. So we have time for, uh, more questions. I think we'll go ahead and in about five minutes, take questions from the audience, but I have one more question. So why did Dr. Bill Gessler change your title to president instead of CEO? Uh, I understood that past presidents of NTID were called CEO. And so they actually decided to call you president. Do you know why Bill decided to do that and change your title? So it was, it was like, uh, not capitalized. It was chief executive officer in a, in a non-capitalized way. Um, okay. It was not like a formal title. The formal title was vice president, you know, for NAD, right? That's the way it kind of read. But the function in the job position, the title um, included the functions of chief executive officer. So why Dr. Dessler made the decision um, He had two other presidents in other countries. One was in Croatia and one was Kosovo. So these were two different countries where the titling was a, as a president. And so he asked me, why are you not the president? And I didn't have a good answer for him. You know, I didn't even know kind of where that had come from, but he felt at that time that it was important in terms of a titling convention that would help me in the work I was doing when I traveled around. Um, I was doing a lot of outreach work, of course, going to Washington, DC, meeting with members of Congress and the Department of Education. And it felt he felt like the title of president carried a bit more clout. Um, and then vice president of RIT for NTID. Um, so I right. kind of had so there are lots three of titles. <laughs> it was confusing, but um, but yeah, I mean now we've got the president of NTID, and I think that's uh that's an important naming convention. I do think it it helps with national recognition. You know, you are a leader if you are the president of a college or a university, especially for deaf students. That makes sense. Because my understanding is that NTID and Gallaudet University, they usually say president. So I don't know if they have the deaf program at um, CSUN in California. Do they call that person president or? Okay, so it's it's just the program there at CSUN. And here at NTID and Gallaudet, it's called president. Got it. Okay, great. So not CEO, but president. That's very interesting. But But, you know, not capitalized. It was really about the job description. It was about the responsibilities of the job. So the chief executive officer was not really the title as much as it was in the job description. Okay, great. Got it. Thank you so much for clarifying that for me. That's really good information. All right. So I'm going to get questions from the audience. Okay. The first question, and thank you everybody that's in the audience who shared your questions. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to read some of your questions to Alan um, or to Vicki. Okay, so your book was well-written, very entertaining, as well as fun. You were the third deaf president at Gallaudet. No, you were actually the 10th deaf president. Is that right? Is it the 10th president? But they're saying the third. So I was the 10th president of Gallaudet, but the first seven presidents you'll remember were all hearing individuals. Got it. So okay. There, there was Dr. Iken Jordan, of course. Um, so in tech, you know, and then of course now we have Bobby Cordano, but so I was the third deaf president. I'm the 10th in the lineage, but okay. the deaf president. That's clear. Okay, so the question from the audience is, I know the book is about your life, 
but was there any lesson that you wanted to share about the deaf president experience at Gallaudet University? Yeah, I, I did write a little bit about this in the book as well. I didn't go into great depth, but I talk about in the book, some of the issues, some of the challenges when I became president at Gallaudet and NTID as well. I mean, Gallaudet and NTID are, although quite different as institutions, um, NTID is one of 10 colleges under RIT. RIT is responsible for everything in terms of these, these 10 campuses, food services, um, the library services, janitorial, the residential programming, all of that. And NTID is responsible solely for the academics and student engagement. So that's how it breaks out. Now, of course, at Gallaudet, it's kind of all in one. So it's similar like to RIT on that level, it's responsible for everything, food services on campus, library services, the residential programming, um, snow removal, janitorial services, I mean, everything, student services, student life, all of it. I think what makes them different or what I learned when I was at Gallaudet is that Gallaudet is just like any other quote unquote regular university. We have all of the same issues and challenges, student enrollment issues, budget issues, facilities issues, all of it. But what makes Gallaudet unique is that obviously the language on the campus is American Sign Language. Deaf culture is the prevailing culture. So that's what makes Gallaudet unique. But in terms of how you manage the day-to-day -day operations of Gallaudet um, College, Gallaudet University as it later became, it's just like any other university. So that was a lesson that I really learned from being both at NTID and at Gallaudet. Thank you for sharing that answer. I remember when I was involved for um, Deaf President Now, I just really wanna recognize um, Alan and Jim and other leaders um, that gave us two, set up two big busloads of people and to show support for Deaf President Now. We had a lot of support from NTID staff, including Alan, including Jim De Niro and Vicki. Um, I wish I could name them all, but all of those individuals, those staff, professors, administration, they were very involved and they said, yes, we support you. We support you to go to Gallaudet University and to, to join in on that march. And so it was just such a beautiful experience to see that. Uh, we did that within 24 hours. Basically we rented a bus, we stayed overnight, we participated in the march, and then we headed back to Rochester on Sunday night. I mean, we were obviously very tired for class on Monday, <laughs> but you know, we made it happen, you know, over the weekend. It was, it was wonderful. Do you remember that, Alan? I remember it, it's such a wonderful memory. Yeah, Vicki, do you remember that too? Riding them down on the bus? Oh, I remember it. Yep, I remember it very well. <laughs> it was an exciting time. Yes, it was. All right. Let's just say if there was a movie producer that came to the both of you and said, I would like to do a movie about your life and your journey, which actor would you like, which actor would you like to perform you, Alan? Who would you pick? I don't know that that will ever happen. But after Coda's success, you know, maybe never say never, who knows? That's right, you never know. I started thinking about that because I knew this question might come. And there is one person who's no longer alive, oh. unfortunately, but Robin Williams. Oh yeah. I always admired him. And I've been told that I sort of favor him in my looks <laughs> just a bit, just a bit. 
I never thought so. Okay. Yeah. So a long time ago. Yeah, he does. That would be a perfect actor. I was just always really taken by his self-presentation in movies, uh, very philosophical bent and very supportive of young people, students. So I would, I would pick him if I could, if he were still alive. Oh my gosh, I never would have thought of Robin Williams. Yeah, but you are right. He does look like you back in the old days. Yeah, you look very similar. Or bad news, I guess. No, no, no. That's a good choice. That's a good choice. <laughs> okay. Now, the two of you just recently celebrated your 57th wedding anniversary. Is that right? 57th wedding anniversary? Yeah, it's going to be 57 this August. Okay, so this coming August, you both will celebrate your 57th wedding anniversary. First of all, happy early 57th wedding anniversary. So what's your secret to success with your six to make a successful marriage? You answer first, then I'll answer. Um, communication is going to be my first answer. We share everything with each other. I don't know. Do you have any secrets from me? I don't think so. I, mean, I know I have no secrets from Vicky at any, at any rate. We really do share everything. I think respect, mutual respect. Yeah, it's a give and take. This is Vicky speaking. It's a give and take. It's sharing, um, being very open with each other. There, you know, no secrets. If there's a, an issue, you take it, you take it to the table, you talk about it, you share. Um, he does the same. I think you know, the toughest times, obviously, were when our children were younger. That's, that's always hard, raising children. Of course. Um, and, and being at Gallaudet, um, you know, people have their feelings about that. But, you know, I, I didn't really like that. You know, I would talk to him about it, but I didn't talk about it publicly. And he needed somebody that he could talk to. And so we really got into that mode of sort of sharing things. It sounds like you have a lot of mutual respect. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's, that's what makes the marriage work. It's that open communication. And she's also a good cook and I wash dishes. So I still do that. Um, sometimes I cook and if I do, then she washes, but uh, we take turns on that. Well, I have to say that the two of you have such a beautiful marriage. I'm really impressed with the two of you. And the reason why is because when I was a student at RIT, you always asked how was David doing? And I was thinking to myself, wow, because you know that relationships are very important. So, and, and by the way, David says hello to the two of you. <laughs> and David is still, you know, riding his bike, just like Alan. And Alan, oh, I just want to let you know that. Well, he is an avid biker. I'm not, I mean, I like to bike, but I am not as avid as David is. Well, I just want to let you know that David cooks. I do not do the cooking. I do the cleaning and David does the cooking and he prefers to cook. And I actually burn food because I talk too much and it just, I burn the food. So I just end up cleaning up, which is fine. Hey, David, if you're watching, you rock. Thank you so much for cooking for me. I love you so much. All right. Uh, we have one more question from the audience. Um, so what are the five most amazing tips for a leader? Like, what would you share with the audience on, on being such a good leader? Five. Uh, we could go on and on all night. Okay. Well, if you want to share one. All right. The number one thing I will say is that you have to be open. You have to listen to people. People want to share their perspectives, where they're coming from. You have to be open-minded to really take that all in. And the other thing is that you have to be decisive. I mean, a leader is somebody who does make decisions and sometimes they're not easy, but those decisions should only be made after a full engagement with the community, listening to everybody, getting their perspectives. And maybe people don't agree with each other even after long conversations, but ultimately uh, that decision is not going to make everybody happy. Some people will be happy, some people won't be, 
that's also part of being a leader. Some people will be upset. Um, some people don't care, mm -hmm. but it's important to have those lines of communication open, share the rationale as to why the decisions were made. You know, some people would come up to you and say, I don't agree with this, that, or the other thing, and that's okay. And we can talk it out and I can kind of hear where you're coming from. And maybe the best we can hope for is to agree to disagree. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. I agree. And I think that's just part of it as well. That's part of the whole process. I think also team building is critical. That's right. People should feel that they are part of the, the, the process, part of the whole discussion. And people need to be recognized. They work hard, they do good work, and you need to praise people and praise them publicly so that other people know um, that you care for the people that you employ. And obviously I could go on and on and on, but that's what I would say in terms of leadership qualities. I agree. Uh, you bring up a, such an excellent point about leadership and, and thank you so much for sharing those points. And thank you so much for sharing uh, your leadership tips um, I think it's on the last page of your, the last 10 pages of your book. And for the audience, if you buy the book, um, and if you want to learn more about leadership, please take the time to read. And of course, obviously read the entire book, but also <laughs> look at the end too, and see the tips that he shares. I have to just share with you that I learned so much about leadership through Alan. So thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, I think the last part was like a kind of a summary of everything that had gone before in the book mm -hmm. that I had gone through on the journey, some of the lessons learned on the journey. I kind of brought it to, to the end, uh, frustrations, challenges, things that I overcame, obstacles, as well as successes. I did a recap at the end, kind of like the important, in those important qualities of leadership. You tied it together so well. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I know it's not um, easy to go back and talk about your childhood experiences and memories and also take leadership skills from your full journey and put it down to the, the summary at the end. So thank you for taking um, time to do that because those tips were really beneficial. Um, so we are out of time, um, but I do want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the two of you so much for your valuable time this evening, and thank you for sharing your personal journey uh, with us, and just really everything that you have done for NAD, NTID, and Gallaudet University. It really is amazing, and from all of us, we all look up to you and to Vicki, and we really appreciate everything that the two of you have done for the deaf community. Uh, you just don't realize, I don't think, but you have impacted so many of us, all of us. And so we really appreciate everything that you've done for us. So thank you so much, the both of you. Thank you. Thank you for being who you are, Angie. Vicki and I have always remembered you for oh. all of these years from when you were a college student. Oh, thank you. We knew you were one to watch and that you have grown and progressed so well. It's just wonderful to see. Oh, thank you so much for your kind words. And I am so proud of the two of you as well. And for the audience, if you have not had a chance to buy Alan's book, you can buy Alan's book on Amazon or at Gallaudet University, their bookstore, or RIT and NTID's bookstore as well. And I highly recommend that you take the time to purchase the book and read it. It's very easy to read. It's entertaining. It's nice to read with a, you know, a glass of wine or coffee or tea. Um, it's well written. It's, it's a really wonderful book. So again, congratulations on your beautiful book, Alan. Thank you so much. And so now I'm going to pass the floor off to um, Brian Van Voonen, and he will give closing remarks, Brant will. And so I just want to briefly introduce Brant. So Brant is the coordinator for the Maryland Deaf Cultural Digital Library, and 
he just transferred from Austin, Texas, the Austin Community uh, District and Alamino College District of Texas, uh, where he worked in the academy or academic libraries. So Brent, are you ready? I am. All right, well, the floor is yours. Bye everyone. And again, thank you all for your time this evening and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Wonderful. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to thank uh, Angie for the introduction. Thank Alan for the evening. I enjoyed watching this program. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Of course, we want to thank everybody who made tonight's program possible. Our community partners, HCAD, HCLS, and DCDL, who set this program up. Of course, we want to thank our interpreters, Sarah and Jennifer. Good job. I want to thank Angie Officer, who served so ably as a moderator and guided us through this conversation. Of course, thank you to Dr. T. Alan Hurwitz for really revealing who he is to us through this program. Much gratitude to you, sir. And I want to thank the audience for watching tonight. A round of applause for everybody. Now, you should know that there are different ways to get Alan's book, as Angie said. So, of course, you can buy a copy, but you can also go to your local library and see if they have a copy. And you can come to the DCDL's website and borrow an ebook copy which you can read on your iPad, your computer, or your phone. However you get it, the book is well worth the read. And this is the first of more library programs that we will have partnering with HCAD, HCLS, and DCDL. So keep your eyes open for those programs. Again, thank you all for coming. Enjoy your evening. Good night.